Welcome, this is Nujma Minhas. I'm with Bizala with Global Village Space. Earlier today, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan has repudiated any thoughts of a deal with anyone, including the establishment. This is something that rumors had been uh, floating around Islamabad and the country as to the reason why he left Islamabad on Thursday morning when he gave the government an ultimatum of six days to announce the elections. With you, one of those vloggers who said that there was probably a deal, he's now repudiated. What are your thoughts now? You know, like everybody else, I'm confused um, and I have spoken to several people since yesterday and um, uh, I did by vlog, which you referred to immediately after his speech. I was still uh, in D-Chalk at that time where people were waiting for him to arrive and we also knew that he had to speak at the uh, Centaurus uh, Chok, which is the Fessel Avenue. And at that time, even when he spoke at the Santoros Choke and uh, he said that uh, he has decided not to do a sit-in, not to do a dharna uh, because of the potential violence between the people and the police and the people and the military. He said the regime, uh, the Sharif Sadari government actually wants a, a confrontation between the people and the military. He said the military, the police, the military and the people, they all belong to this country and he doesn't want confrontation. Mm -hmm. And however, he gave a six day ultimate to the government to basically give an election date, otherwise he'll come back. Since his reference was so specific, you know, I immediately did a vlog within 30, 40 minutes or one hour afterwards. And I thought that there is some sort of understanding between him and either the government or the third party, uh, maybe the establishment. I think I didn't basically say the establishment in the vlog. And since then, other people have speculated that there was a deal is by an important a foreign personality in the Middle East or the deal has been given by a judicial personality, an ex, uh, uh, an ex important uh, personality belonging to the judiciary. So, so much of the speculation was going on. But now, um, and even at the time, I thought that the reasons he had given for uh, returning back and not doing the dharna, which I thought was always a very impractical option uh, in my vlogs, I always didn't like the idea of the dharna, I didn't like the idea of him sitting uh, in Islamabad. So I thought that he is being a smart politician and he's giving uh, like the uh, typical the other reasons such as saying that because of the violence that might be expected, he decided to turn back. Yes, he gave the reasons that he is worried for the kind of violence that has taken place across Punjab. Uh, five PTI workers and followers that already died. PTI has five martyrs. Uh, in the cause, I mean, uh, and, and he said that he's afraid that there can be more, more violence between his people, between the people and the police and the army. But I thought that there is something else happening. Uh, and I still suspect, uh, I mean, to this point, I'm still trying to grasp as to what really happened. And many other people are still trying to grasp. But it now, I, I have spoken to people who are with him in Peshawar and also people who are here and who were with him in Peshawar. And I have heard and I've been told that uh, one day before or two days before this, he was definitely approached by some quarters and he was offered that if you don't do the march, we will guarantee elections, early elections. But he turned down the offer because he didn't trust them. And also he don't want to go that route anymore uh, because he thinks that this is not the right way in the Pakistani politics. And then there was no real deal making uh, on 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 25th um, uh, on or on 26 on 26 morning when he was actually here. So, so you're saying that that deal is not on the table any longer. This is what I've been told that there was in fact an offer, not a deal. There was an offer that you don't do the long march, you don't do this hakiki azadi march onto Islamabad, and we will guarantee you will make it possible that there will be early elections. But however, he refused accepting that and he marched on to Islamabad. And then the sources say that there was no more offer of that kind. However, the speculations continue. And I am personally confused because I still don't fully understand that what was his exact motive of coming to Islamabad and saying this thing that I would not return back unless I get an election date. Because I have been living in Islamabad through all the dharnas uh, right from the dharna of Dr. Tahir al-Qadri in 2013, which continued for more than a week. Then it was a PPP government. This was before the election. And the um, whom uh, Rahman Malik, late Rahman Malik, used to be the NDA minister. And then I was here through other dharnas, the TLP dharnas, the 2014 prolonged 126-day dharna of Imran Khan and Tahir al-Qadri. So I have seen the dynamics of the dharnas. 
and I personally believe it's my analysis. It's my analysis that dharnas look important and powerful on day one, and from day two onward, the power and the impact of the dharna starts to reduce. Then dharna becomes a logistical nightmare for the organization or the party that does the dharna. You need food, you need latrines, you need water, you need other kinds of things. And dharnas can only be successful in large organic cities like Lahore and Karachi or Paris or London, where the local citizens, where there are millions of citizens locally who can keep on coming and going. And in 2014, the 126 day dharna of Imran Khan and Tehri Ken Saaf was sustained because of the large number of what you call as the day scholars or day protesters that used to arrive from Rawalpindi and Islamabad and used to return back in the night. So in the morning, there would be several thousand people to hear him. And by evening after his speech, he would be left with only a few, few hundred people. So how do you explain him going back? Because his, his reasoning that it was due to the violence that his people would face. I mean, we all know that that whole night there was massive gas shelling in Dijok. We were here ourselves, so we know the, 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 the intensity of that. But is that sufficient? I mean, after all, in Punjab, for two days earlier, we'd already been seeing beatings, people being picked up. Throughout the day in Punjab, we, we were seeing the same scenes. Hamadas are being beaten up, uh, having a shell attack his face. O Umar Ayu being beaten up. So he was seeing that throughout the day. So what was it new that he was expecting at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, which suddenly made him feel that, oh, there's going to be a lot of violence? If you go by his own words in the latest press talk, which he did a few hours ago, he said he didn't expect this kind of violence. He and his other leaders had, point, had repeatedly uh, asserted, that they, and he had himself said in so many jalsas, that we don't expect any violence because we want to bring people along with their families, with their wives, with their daughters, with their children. And the idea was to basically bring uh, hundreds and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Political rhetoric says two million, but we always knew uh, and I have said in my vlogs that, you know, even bringing 200,000 people into Islamabad is a huge achievement. And in the end, he did arrive with a very large number of people. But the kind of violence that was unleashed by police across Punjab, I mean, according to Rana Sanawla and the figures I've seen, 4,114 raids were conducted across Punjab. Mm. And I've also seen the figure that 1,100 private homes were raided in the early morning. In the Why does that house. really matter though? Because if you think about it, I mean, we're told that thousands are about to come. So if they picked up 1,100, 1,200, 4,000 people, what does that matter in the bigger scheme no, of things? No, 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 no. Um, uh, uh, we don't know how many people they picked up. They picked up hundreds of people. But I think the strategy of the government, uh, a very draconian and very evil strategy, was not necessarily to arrest the people or to stop them from coming towards Islamabad. Mm. The strategy was to create such an element of fear across Punjab that the middle class families who would otherwise come out with their wives, with their mothers, with their daughters, with their children, with their young uh, you know, boys, mm. would be frightened of the consequences. And this is precisely that was achieved across Punjab, in Lahore, in Faisalabad, in Gujrawala, in Sialkot, in other cities, where police was allowed under the MPO3 uh, uh, you know, which which is actually the which is actually the mandate of the deputy commissioner. What is MPO three? So MPO three is the maintenance of public order three. Okay. This is a sort of an ordinance and act, and uh, which is actually a draconian law available to the Pakistani uh, administrations. Uh, and outside India, Pakistan, such laws do not exist. Mm. But in India, it is probably used much more sparingly because we haven't really heard the Congress ordering a crackdown against the BJP homes mm. or BJP in power ordering a crackdown against thousands of uh, uh, c Congress leaders. It hasn't happened in India. These kind of things are used in India in occupied Kashmir on the northeast troubled areas mm. where they have insurgencies or ethnic problems and sort of anti-state political movements. So major political parties like PPP, PMLN and PTI do not use these kind of tactics against each other. That is the common decency that has been violated in this country after 1970s. What does the MPO3 allow you to do as a state? I think the MPO3 basically allows you to enter, uh, to basically arrest and detain the people uh, without a formal process of warrant. Uh, the deputy commissioner can say that he fears and in his judgment, there is a risk to the public order and such and such people can actually be detained. Mm -hmm. So whenever, and then they go and they basically uh, uh, 
uh, they go and arrest the political workers. So police was allowed by the deputy commissioner. And this is what I've, talk, I've spoken to police officers who say that you don't have to blame the police because we work under the deputy commissioner. And in Punjab, there is no new police act, unlike the KP. So in KP, they, have a more, they had a more forward looking police act, which restricts police from, from so many actions which are possible in Punjab and which are possible in Sindh. So the deputy commissioner authorized the police. So police entered the homes, jumped the walls, broke open the gates and the doors, entered the homes, harassed the people. In most instances, they were not able to arrest anyone, but the purpose was to go and harass the families. So the message was sent to the people of Punjab that, you know, the glove is off uh, and, you know, the steel knuckles are there. And anyone who comes on the street to march towards Islamabad or to protest inside the town centre. Is this the reason why for many, many people are criticising the PTI Punjab political leadership for not turning up? Is this the reason why they didn't turn That's up? That's a separate debate. The debate within the PTI is against so many prominent leaders of central Punjab and south Punjab that they needed to, whatever the violence was, they needed to bring out their own people. Uh, like there were a few thousand people that arrived under Senator On Abbas, for instance, who were here. Uh, I have seen them. There were so many young men uh, from Bahawal Nagar and Bahawalpur in South Punjab areas who were here uh, in Dichok. Uh, uh, but, you know, the huge numbers that were expected from Lahore, from Faisalabad, from Bhujawala never arrived. So the most of the people that arrived here were from KP and then from areas after Atak. So a large number of crowds from areas in North Punjab joined Imran Khan's caravan and kafila. And then there were people from Rawalpindi and Islamabad uh, that beefed up the crowds and fought the police on the d -choke. But the disappointment within the ranks and files of the PTI is this, that many people who were arrested, they allowed themselves to be arrested so that they don't have to face the risks of the police action. But having said this, you also have to realize that the police action across Punjab and what we have seen the footage on television in Lahore was extremely brutal. The way when you see the way Dr. Yasmin Rashid, the 70 year old uh, ex former health minister was treated. So there was a, there was a cancer, a cancer no. patient. I mean, the, she, the way she was treated. So the kind of reign of terror, I'm surprised. You know, I, I heard that Lahore High Court has issued some orders against this kind of crackdown subsequently. But the kind of crackdown which was done across Punjab was a clear violation of the constitution of Punjab, of Pakistan, and, and was a clear violation of the previous orders of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the High Court. Yet the government did not fear the court action. Action and was desperate to carry on this thing. And this way, Do you it, think it has Imran not... Khan has cried wolf too often? Are people going to take him seriously uh, when he announces that he'll be back again with a bigger, badder crowd? I'm not sure he's going to come back after six days because I think coming back to Islamabad in six days is kind of very improbable because I don't know why he said six days. I mean, this is what makes me very confused. Because, you know, if he would have said that we will come back in 15 days or in three weeks or we will give them this much time, we have, we have you know, made a point, we came here, we brought these, you know, hundreds and thousands of people, you know, and, but given the fact that there has been violence and the, and the government has called the military uh, and we don't want to basically face the military, we don't want Pakistani people to be facing the military, it would have made a more wiser stand by having locked himself into the six day condition, I don't expect him to uh, come back to Islamabad in six days. Now it has to be seen, I will probably be meeting along with a group of journalists uh, within a day or so, he has invited journalists to meet him in Peshawar. Mm -hmm. So I would like to understand, I don't think he's going to come back here in just six days. Do you think the PTI party has done enough strategy now for the for the, for the next, um, the, the long march that they've announced in six days? Assuming it goes ahead. I mean, I understand that you don't think it will go ahead. But they've announced that they're going to have one in six days. Do you think they're making the right strategies? Are they thinking about what went wrong this last time when they came to Islamabad? Or do they think nothing went wrong? In his press talk um, several hours ago today, he said that we will be more prepared. He warned the government of their tactics, the kind of violence the Punjab police and the police had generally used. And he said that we were unprepared. We didn't expect this. We were totally... Now, he... He said, we'll be more prepared. So someone asked him the question that, what do you mean by prepared? And I was worried, what's he going to say in return? But he handled it very well by saying this thing that, look, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were not prepared. He didn't really elaborate by the word preparation. Uh, 
because to any major political uh, leader of his significance, he's been the former prime minister. He's very frank in his comments. Mm -hmm. He speaks too much, uh, you know, to the journalists. And somehow or the other, his media team also uh, does not ensure this thing if, uh, that, you know, they don't really screen out the journalists. Anywhere in the world, uh, when there is such an important politician, the media team always screens the, for instance, Shahbaz Sharif or Nawaz Sharif or Mohtarma Mariam Nawaz and others, they're not going to call everybody to a press conference. They, they only call the journalists. If you look when Mariam Nawaz does his press con her press conferences, only some very kosher and very uh, safe kind of journalists are allowed into a press conference and there's never any tough questions. The same is the situation with Bilawal. Never, you never hear a tough question. You never hear a difficult question. But all kind of questions are asked to the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. So, but he said we'll be more prepared. So what does it really mean we'll be more prepared? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I don't expect. Uh, he, he does mention one thing. He said, we have, I have already written a letter. I have already written a personal letter to the Chief Justice of Pakistan asking him to clarify and examine the situation that do the people and the political parties of Pakistan, they don't have the right to have a peaceful uh, demonstration. And having said this, I was wondering at the time that the kind of example that has been set by PMLN government in Punjab is very dangerous because uh, because one, once you unleash the state terror through the police against the public, then ultimately at some point the public will also lose their patience. What if the people start getting themselves armed and they also start attacking the police? Mm -hmm. Then the only force that will be left between the state and the people would be Pakistan army. And that's a very dangerous situation. I mean, this is uh, what they did in the Lahore is actually a sort of encouraging civil war in the country. And I hope the, and I'm still waiting for Supreme Court of Pakistan to, to call the deputy commissioner, the commissioner, the secretary interior, and the police officers to take a slow moto notice. And I'm surprised that the courts have not really taken any action so far. You know, I want to bring you towards uh, what happened in parliament yesterday. Uh, we, throughout the country, 48 to 72 hours earlier, we've seen massive violence taking place. And yet Parliament came in, hardly mentioned it, and went straight into passing the NAB ordinance, uh, the amendment that they've done to NAB, and getting rid of the overseas Pakistanis' right to vote. I mean, what was happening there and why did that take such a precedence in their minds that out of all the times they had to, take, they had to now do it right now? You see, first of all, there are a few things we have to understand about the nature of the current Sharif Zadari government and the parliament that supports it. Technically speaking, yes, a vote of no confidence is a constitutional thing and you can change a government to a vote of no confidence and they are a legal or constitutional creation. But for all political purposes, this is an illegitimate parliament and illegitimate government. The way the government was overthrown, the way the horse trading was done, the way these 10, 11 political parties joined hands, I'm sorry for let me shut it down. So, sorry for this. So, the way all this uh, political alliance was engineered, was created with serious allegations and charges, with, you know, video footages of, you know, literally scenes of horse trading, the way people were bought and everything, and no real uh, explanation has ever been offered as to why the Imran Khan government had been overthrown. Whatever narrative was made of the government's economic inefficiency has actually failed when we have seen the figures of the national, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, NAC National Economic Account National Accounting Committee, uh, that how this is the second year where the economy was growing for more than 5.5 percent, and this year it was almost literally 6 percent. Mm. So the nature of this parliament is very suspect in the eyes of the most people, especially in the eyes of the intelligentsia. So while they keep on talking very tough, this parliament itself feels itself internally to be an illegitimate parliament. And in the un indecent haste in which they called the joint session of the parliament to pass this very uh, important legislation where they have rejected the right of the overseas Pakistanis vote or tried to basically made it meaningless by giving them some seats in National Assembly and Provincial Assembly and denying them the constitutional right to vote in their own constituencies which is worldwide accepted and which was actually the way the Constitution of Pakistan defines it and also the Supreme Court judgments define it. So, and also they, this is one piece of legislation. Then in the second piece of legislation, they have abolished the 
the voting through the electronic voting machines. They're also trying to bring a new chairman uh, of the National Accountability uh, NAB and they have also made changes in one single day. They have done so much changes in the NAB laws. So this actually shows a mindset of a fear and panic. So while they're saying that this government will continue, uh, will, uh, will, will complete its term till August 2023, their actions actually reflect otherwise. They're still guessing they are desperate to get the IMF package. Initially, they said we'll never raise the petrol and the diesel prices. Now, in the first step, they have raised uh, the prices of petrol and diesel by rupees 30 per liter, which is unprecedented in the history of this country or recent history. The prices have never been increased by that margin in one single go. But then economists are telling us that they will further raise the prices very soon in the next few days because they're lobbying very hard in Washington to get the support of Washington uh, onto the IMF. So very confused government. Uh, and while they say that they will continue till August 2023, I don't think they will be able to continue till August 2023. I'd like to get your thoughts on, a, on something slightly different. A case has been registered against Iman Mazari Hazir. Um, what is the basis for this case? Uh, I think the case in, in its legal sense, the case is true that when Dr. Shiri Mazari, the former human rights uh, minister, was literally taken away outside her home in a, in a manner which was then described by her daughter as abduction. And that was a very true description, the way she would whisk away from a car. The state agencies and the police do not arrest people like this. This has not been the norm in the culture, especially a woman who was very old. She says she's almost 70 years of age. Uh, and at that particular moment, Iman Hazir, I think she was walking, uh, she is herself a lawyer and some reporter asked her that who do you think has done it and she blamed the army chief general Kamar Javed Bajwa for that. Uh, but I didn't expect that a case will be registered because she was a young woman and a child of a mother, a single parent uh, living, she was, she's, a, she's a daughter that is living in a single parent situation. And at that time, when she was very worried um, for the safety, the security, and the future uh, of her mother, she she would probably be th she all kind of uh, all kind of very uh, dangerous ideas might be on her mind in panic in a state of panic, and and she blurted out those irresponsible comments that I you know who else apart from General Bajwa. So whereas technically and legally, the judge Edwin Brown Jack, which has brought the case against her. Um, it makes a legal sense, but I think politically it's a very unwise step. Uh, Why because, do you think it's an unwise step? You see, you have to understand Iman Hazar. I mean, Iman Hazar is a sort of a left of Pakistani politics ever since she came back to Pakistan after completing her studies in law from UK. She has been a very uh, pronounced and noted critic, uh, not only of the establishment, but also of Imran Khan. She has been a very... A prominent critic uh, of Imran Khan, of Pakistan Tariqi and Saf, and the politics of her mother. Right. Despite the fact that she lived with her mother under the same roof, and her mother has been an important member of the uh, cabinet and party of the Tariqi and Saf, she has been a very vocal critic of Imran Khan and PTI. And she has been a vocal critic of Imran Khan and PTI is because she is anti-establishment, right? And she thought that Imran Khan and PTI are poor establishment. You know, I have reason to believe from common friends in the city that she also, you know, um, uh, is very much against me because she thinks that I am very pro-establishment. I'm a great supporter of the establishment. So this is her background and profile. And in this profile, the Judge Edwin Brand, the Jack Branch, bringing this official case against her is a very unwise step. Legally, it is correct. The case is true legally, but it's politically very unwise. And I think as the case will progress, he has already been granted a pre-arrest bail uh, by Islamabad High Court because given the politics of the country, hundreds and thousands of people are saying all sorts of irresponsible mm. things on the Pakistani street. Right. Politics always has its own dynamics. To control the political dynamics, you have to do actions that soothe the nerves and change the narrative. So, so we should dismiss it as white noise rather than highlight it. They should, have told, they should have just ignored it. Once her mother was back, she was not going to repeat those words. By highlighting it, by bringing a case against her, they will turn Iman Hazar Mazari into a great figure. Uh, into a hero for the and, and whereas there are very whereas there is a very powerful uh, military establishment in the country, 
there is also a very strong anti-establishment lobby in the country, in the civil society, mm -hmm. in the English-speaking community, within the bar associations, the legal community. And now by doing this unwise step, the judge adjoint branch have given them a hero. Mm -hmm. And this is going to become very ugly. And I, if anyone would have consulted me or I would have advised them not to take the stupid step, it has been a very unwise step, which they have done. And I'm surprised they have done it. We thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today.